church giving and its economy. The church has to have its own economy, its own finances in order to be successful as a church. Otherwise, there is no church that is respected without finances. You get it? There's no church that is what? Without finances. Even political people and they go only for, for voting issues to churches that are, they may have number, but maybe if they don't have money, they may go there for canvassing for elections, all right? Because of the voters, right? But to really create a relationship with the church, they will not bother if the church is poor. Are you hearing me? If the church is poor, they will not bother. When the church is poor, it's not respected. It's not respected. Nobody, can I tell you this? The Bible says that a poor person has no friends. The, the Bible says that a poor person is hated by his people, his neighbor, his, his friends, or his people are supposed to be friends or neighbors or something like that. It, it just told you that. It tells you that there are unnecessary problems with poor people. How many of you know that? If you want really problems, go to poor people. They will hate you that you have a new TV and they don't have. You can have, a re you can have a great relationship with your neighbor. Once you buy a flat screen TV and they have a box TV, you have started a problem. <laughs> it does not need to be anything serious because poverty makes people to lose their minds. You get it. That's why they will ban a school that they need for their kids tomorrow. But when they are angry, they will ban the school. Then they will ban the library. But they're going to need it tomorrow. Because poverty closes the mind. You see that? This is not to blame. I'm just diagnosing or kind of like explaining the reality of what it does. Now the church is really not supposed to be poor. Because when the church is poor, it will be disrespected. Or if the church is poor, it will always attract poor people only. The gospel is for everybody. So I'm going to show you some things today. Now look at this. Early church finances. How, they, how, how, how did they acquire their finances and how did they spend their finances? Because normally people, uh, some people today who don't give, they want to know uh, about the spending of money. Most of the people who don't give, they want to know about the spending of money. And people who give, most of the time they don't care because they've given into the house of God. You see that? Now, how did they receive the money? The, the money it was very easy. They received it through offerings from the generous givers. Through offerings from the generous givers. That's what they did. The church is not a business. It depends on the generosity of the people. The level of the generosity of the people of the church determines how much money is flowing to the church and how rich the church is, worth the church is, and things like that. But the, the people can decide to make their church poor. I'm not sure you get what I'm trying to say to you. Are you hearing me? The people can decide, no, no, no. We don't want our church to be, to be excellent. We don't want our church to have expensive things. We just want our church to have like a poor sound and, and <coughs> hello, <laughs> can you hear me? You know, all those things. They can decide. It's, it's the decision from the people. So can you see that God has trusted your generosity that his house will be respected in the world? Check the people of Israel. They built a state-of-the-art temple. The temple of Solomon, right? They say the temple of Solomon because he was a leader, not, not because money came from him. Money came from the people, all right? They built a temple that was a state of the art in such a way that nations will travel. It became a tourist destiny. Can you believe that a church becoming a, a, a destiny for kings to come, Queen of Sheba and other kings will come not to do anything but to have a look. Because the people of Israel, they use their wealth and they use their finances in order to, in other words, they did not look at giving as we do today. 
They looked at giving as worship. They looked at giving as worship. So they depended on the generous uh, 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 givings or offerings of the, of, of, of the people, right? Now, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, the Bible says everyone should give as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or from compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, in the church, they depended on the cheerful giver. The word cheerful giver has something to do with, with excitement. The people were excited who cannot wait to give. Are you getting this? The people are excited. How many people do we have today who get excited to go to church because they're going to give? Not because the worship is going to be good. Are you hearing that? Do we have people today who go to church excited, you know, first and foremost, forgiving. No, we have people who are coming to receive. We have people who want everything to be excellent. They want worship to be excellent. They want the preacher to preach well. They want uh, the place to be cozy and comfortable, but they don't think about giving. But how can it be if you don't make your contributions? How, how can it be if you don't tithe? How can it be if you don't honor your pledges? How can it be? You know, they depended on the cheerful givers. They depended. And, the Bible, uh, uh, and Paul is speaking very clear in the church because he knows the human heart. He knows the human heart. He's, 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 he speaks that a person must give according to what he has purposed in his heart. In other person, a person has to decide in his heart. And many people are very happy with this scripture, but this is the most dangerous scripture because God God leaves you to your heart. All right? God gives, leaves you to your heart. Now, what happens now, when God leaves you to your heart, it will depend if your heart is saturated by God's word or saturated by the cares of this world. So now it's going to show on your giving. So do, do you know that giving exposes the heart? Uh, is, is it clear to you? It, 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 it does what? Yeah, it exposes the heart. It exposes the heart. It really exposes the heart. It exposes where the heart has gone. Because Jesus says that wherever your treasure is, he says that your what? Your heart will be there also. If you are in debt, is the heart issue. Nothing else. Let's speak the truth. It's not needs. It's heart. Heart's desires. Huh? You bought a car that you can't pay for. You loved the car without checking your financial ability. You added more financial burdens without multiplying your income. Because your concentration was not on income, but it was on having things. Nobody gets into debt blindfolded. People get to debt with their eyes open. Am I lying in this house? So you get it. Though we can say, oh God, oh we feel for you. But really you put yourself into there. Nobody forced you. Nobody forced you to open an account. Nobody forced you to buy a car on uh, credit. Nobody forced you anything. You, you did it by yourself. So I, okay, sorry, let me not talk about you. I, I did it by myself so, because, so that you would not be offended. So if I'm in debt, then I did it by myself. So the Bible says now, you, 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 everybody must give according to what he has purposed in his heart. So there has to be a purpose in the heart when you're a believer to give in the church. And many don't have this purpose. This purpose does not exist in their lives. So Paul says, if you're a believer, there has to be a purposing about giving in your heart. There has to be purpose in his heart. Okay, then he says purpose is heart and the person must give, right? So now here's the issue now. A person must give purpose in the heart. If I give, it exposes my heart. You get it? If I'm a medical doctor, and I bring my tithe of 500 rand. You, you get it. 
It just shows my heart. Are you kidding? It just, it, just, it just shows my heart. If I'm a professional nurse and I just bring my tithe of 300 rand, you know, yeah, yeah. And then there's a domestic worker who brings the tithe of 500 rand. The issue is the heart. Sometimes it's not what you have, but it's the heart that determines. And the heart exposes its desires. So now here's the issue. If I earn 30,000 every month and then I decide to give the tithe, tenth, the tithe of 1,000 rand, it just shows where my income went first, that it did not prioritize God and his house and that I really care less about God's house. Oh, you don't like this message today? It, it really... I think this message today is not nice, eh? It's not yummy. Are you getting that? So you cannot give without your heart being exposed of where you are with God. You get it? So now, Jesus speaks about the heart and he speaks about the seed. The seed fell on the thorny ground. The seed fell on the rocky ground. The seed fell on the on the good ground and the good ground produce hundredfold sixtyfold fiftyfold according to its ability but the good ground was accurate to its ability but there's a thorny ground oh god the thorny ground he says the cares of this world the seed of the word wants to grow but the cares is crippling the growing of the word. You get it? So in giving, you can have some thorns that are, shock, that, are, that are choking your giving life. You can have some thorns and rocks and stones that are suffocating your giving life. You get, you get that? It's not judgment. You just need to know where you are and also say, God, help me. Help me. I want to be useful in your house. I want to be an asset in your house. In fact, the Bible says we can choose. Paul says there are all types of vessels in the house of God. And it says that if we purge ourselves, do you know what does it mean to purge yourself? It's not nice. You do that to yourself. Sometimes the things you want to buy, you don't buy them because I want to be faithful in the house. You know, you know sometimes you look at the shoe and say, Eesh, if I buy this shoe, I won't be able to give my tithe. You are purging yourself. In the house of God. You see? Now. Uh, <clears throat> they depended on the generous givers. Right? How did they spend their finances? Do you want to know that? In the early church. The church of Paul. The church of Peter. The church of Matthew. How did they spend? How did they spend the money? How did they spend the money in the church? Right? Now. You need to know. That they spend the money on two things that I'm going to tell you. Nothing else. Two things. Oh, that church was blessed on two things. They spend the money on the poor people. Number two, they spend the money on their pastors and nothing else. Hey. Yeah, you see that? And somebody said, I wish that we could be like that church. Just wait until I come. <laughs> you see? Uh, they spend it on poor believers. The book of Galatians chapter 2 verse 9 to 10. Galatians chapter 2 verse 9 to 10. You know, um, the Bible says that and when James, James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me. This is Paul speaking. They, uh, uh, they, they gave Barnabas and me a right of hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles. In other words, preach to the Gentiles. They to the circumcised. In other words, they were going to preach to the Jews. We are going to preach to the Gentiles. They divide the work of ministry. But they wanted us to remember the poor. To remember what? To remember the poor. And Paul says, and I too was eager to do the same. In the church before, when you are, when you are sent to preach, the emphasis was that the collection of the day must cover the poor people. 
If there's a widow, that widow must be taken care of. So that was the emphasis of the early church. They spent the money on the poor. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28. The Bible says, uh, chapter 4 verse 28, it says, He who formerly stole, in other words a thief, a person who used to be a thief. Ephesians 4 28. It says, he who stole, he who, he, he who stole, still no longer, right? If you're a thief, this, it's, Paul says, stop it, right? But rather, let him labor, let him work. Working with what? With his hands. What is good? That he may have something to give him who has a need. Who has need. Can you see that? Paul says that if you're a thief and you're stealing and stealing people's things, now stop stealing. Work the good work. Do the good work, right? But it says if we do the good work for what? To support the people who are in need. Paul is not even mentioning your family here. He says to support the people who are, who are what? In need. People who have need. Okay? So stop. But as you work, you work. This is the early church, I must repeat. They work with the poor in mind. When a person receives a salary, they think about the poor. When a person incre has increase in his salary, right? Promotion, they think about the poor. But do we? Uh-uh. We think about the car, the brands, you know, and all other things. Okay? Can you see the emphasis of, on the poor? Let me give you the last scripture. In Romans chapter, in Romans chapter 15, verse 25, we're going to continue with other verses. 15, 25 to 26, right? The Bible says, But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Paul says he's going to Jerusalem to do what? To minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia. This is the church. And Achaia. 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 To make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. Now, this is another church giving to another church, taking care of the poor. That's how the money was spent in an early church. You get it? I will tell you the reason why they were able to do this that we fail to do today. Do, do, do you know any church? Do you know any church that just spend their money on the poor? I mean like almost their whole money we don't have, right? Right, so we've covered they spend the money on the poor, right? Number two, they spend their money on their pastors. They spend the money on what? First Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13 to 14. Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13 to 14. Paul says, do, uh, do, you, do you not know that those who work among the holy things of the temple eat of the offerings of the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? Even so, the Lord has ordained. Somebody says the Lord has ordained. I don't know if it's, it's the same translation now. The Lord has commanded, all right? It's the same thing. The Lord has commanded that those who preach what? The gospel should live from what? Those who preach the gospel should go to work. Did the Bible say that? Did the Bible say that God commanded that those who preach the gospel must go to work? Did it say that? It, it, God commanded what? He commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from what? From the gospel they preach. So that is what God commanded. Now ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. If you keep on listening to all the people who are not your pastors, you will have ideas that are from the world that you don't know anything about but confident and become a fool. Because pastors must go to work. If they want to have money, they must go to work. Everybody must work. Right? But God has ordained that those, those, in fact it says that those who work in the temple must, 
you understand, must eat of the offerings of the temple. Did you see that? Must eat of the holy things of the temple. And those who serve at the altar must partake of the offerings of the altar. So can you see? Is that clear? That's not the gospel. The gospel of the Bible. Not the gospel of, the, of Facebook. You see? So now, they spend money on their pastors. Now, 1 Corinthians against the same chapter, verse 11. Uh, the same chapter. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 11. Let me show you something here. You know what Paul is saying to the people? He says that if we have sown spiritual things for you, right? We have sown spiritual things for you, right? Um, and I like the translation, the pastor's Bible. <laughs> the pastor's Bible. You know, it is a pastor's Bible. He says, if we have sown spiritual seed in you, in you, if I sow spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? Who, 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 who preaches spiritual things? Paul. Who's Paul? The pastor. And other apostles, right? Spiritual things. Huh? We preach to you until you have a breakthrough. We preach to you until your mind changes. We preach to you until your life is, is lifted. We preach to you until your loved one gets saved. We preach to you until God has... You, you get it? Then he says, when we have done that, he is asking the Corinthians, not because he is asking them, he is telling them. It's a, is it a rhetoric question? Is it the right word? He says, if we have sown seed among you, spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap material harvest from you? You know material. You guys don't understand this. Material means tangible. Huh? It means something you can touch. Material means the things of the world. Material things means money, suits, shoes, food, house, car, material. Why do people criticize pastors if they have material things while they preach spiritual things and when the uh, exchange has happened and people laugh at yeah. hey, he's a very humble man of God and the man of God goes, goes the, you know with a big big pants and you know and the big coat and hallelujah praise the Lord you know and people say oh my pastor is so humble he's a, he, he's a man of God and then when he goes home he says please he calls some ushers and says hey, uh, brothers hey, just, just give me a push it, it has, the car has to be kick -start, kickstarted are you hearing me and then they say he's humble God has never called us to be humble the calling of the pastor is not being humble. The calling of the pastor is to preach the true word to you. Is to preach the will of God to you. Is it clear to you? So, so can you see now, there's nothing wrong when pastor has material things. He's supposed to have material things. It's the will of God that pastors have material things. It's a real the only thing that's wrong is when the pastor is going to manipulate the church in order to have material things. But having material things, it's not wrong. Every pastor must be packed with material things, including moi. Are you getting it? So the issue is this. Do you give material things to your pastor? As the church. Or you are just happy that he's taking Uber. 
<laughs> My pastor is very simple. He was <laughs> simple pastor. Look at Abashada. So, so do you see it? Let's take another scripture if you don't believe me and explain this further. Galatians 6 verse 6. Are you getting something out of this? Am I boring you? Yeah, I know. I'm not going in like preaching it. Eh, eh, no, not today. It must come the other time. <laughs> All right. Are you there? Now look at this, please. Look at this. The Bible says, nevertheless, he who receives instruction, go to, the, go to NIV, please. Is that NIV? Oh, go to, no, go to, to King James or New King James. Do you have King James? Something like that? I want to show you something here. We're speaking about the exchange, that they were spending money on their pastor now, not on the poor, right? And some people are very happy when we say they're spending time. They say, eh, yeah, we should do that. They are very happy. But when you say now they're spending on the pastor, they feel, <coughs> yo, here we go again. Is, is the word of God a word of God or what? Should we go by feelings or go by what God says? Even when we don't feel like? Who is God between us and God? You see? Let him who is taught. Somebody says he was taught. My God, I'm taughting this morning. Are you hear what I'm trying to say to you? I'm really taughting this morning. Let him who is taught the what? The word. Not motivation. Not empowerment. Not workshop. Not training. Who's taught? The word. Let the one who's taught the word share. In what? In all things. With him who teaches. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says that sharing. People must share before it. Are you hearing me? People must what? Let him who's taught the word. It's so painful for the pastors to share the spiritual things while the church is striking on sharing the material things. It makes the life of a pastor terrible. Some pastors are working two jobs today not because they want. And then on Sunday, then people say that the pastor is not powerful. How can it be powerful? He has a boss, you have a boss. He has to account, you have to account. He has a deadline, you have a deadline. He has to present, you have to present. How can you be powerful without spending time with God? How can you be powerful if you come late to your family, you are tired from work? How can you be powerful? Your, your boss is rebuking you as a pastor and is also rebuking your members. All of you are just rebuking and rebuking. rebuking, rebuking. So now who is going to hear God? The church is dead coming from the struggles during the week. The pastor has been struggling in the week himself. Then who is going to encourage who? Who is going to uplift who? I'm not sure if you... Am I making sense to you? Uh, if you want me to be powerful, if you want me every time when I stand here, you hear God speaking, you hear God's power, you hear God speaking to you, and you go out uplifted because God has been speaking to you through me, then I need not to go to work. Then this should be my work. God should be my work. The house of God should be my work. I should have more time to pray for you, for your marriage, for your husband, for your pastor for your tertiary education for your breakthrough and for your I'm not sure are, are, you, are you hearing me I said I, I don't want to preach but ish, this thing I was I think I was born for this thing it, even when I don't want it to come it just comes so are you hearing me so now when, when we teach you you better be sharing baby you can't say, I receive, I receive, I receive. As we teach you and you receive, we are also expecting to receive. Because God has ordained that we should receive. Some people, I'm just preaching. 
I'm preaching. Hey, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm expecting nothing. No, 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 no. Listen, the Bible says we must expect. Yeah, I must do God's will. Trusting that God is going to touch your stony heart. Make it soft. The Bible says that he must share all, he must share in all good things with him who teaches. If it says good things, let, let me try to explain it this to you. It means all the influences that God is giving to you. All the connections God is giving to you. Also connect your pastor. Also connect your pastor. All the businesses you do, all the tenders you have, if you have some tenders, connect your pastor too. Let him have tender too. You're sharing in all good things. If you have an opportunity, uh, you do that. I remember when one of our members, we, we just opened, uh, I think it was an all mutual, big building, big uh, uh, lot of workers that I, I had to come there and speak to them. I was speaking to them almost every Thursday or something like, I'm preaching there, I'm preaching there, I'm preaching there. But who opened the door? It was the member that opened the door that understood that I should share with my teacher in all good things. Is that okay? Are you hearing me? So this is how they spent. They spent money on the poor. Come on class. On the what? Not just poor. You have to understand. Poor believers. Poor what? Oh, today we have poor sinners talking more. Wanting something from church. Oh, you don't like me today. Did you hear what I said to you? They spent money not on poor sinners. You don't get it. I'm saying there's no evidence in the world where the collection for poor sinners was collected. So you had all on television, all on Facebook. Poor sinners who don't have Christ, who know nothing what church is. And they are coming to tell us, you, you should be supporting us. <laughs> yeah, we should be. We should be. No, 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 no. It shouldn't be like that. Now, look at this. So, let me give you the last scripture. Philippians chapter 4, verse 14 to 19. Oh, this one. This one is a long read. <sighs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to read this one. Ah, no, no, no. This one. This one is... Is, nah. is that is that the one? 14, right? Did I say 14? Okay. Now, look at this, please. Nevertheless, you have done well. Paul is speaking to the Philippians. You know, he's telling the Philippians how they've been good to him. You know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, if a pastor... If people give to you, your heart just opens automatically to them. Yeah, I'm telling you. Stop that thing of saying, hey, yeah, yeah, the pastor is choosing. Sometimes you don't choose. Your heart chooses for you according to how people are treating you. Oh, you did not hear what I'm saying. Are you hearing that? Aren't pastors uh, also human? Yeah. Look at Chet. Paul is speaking something that he has never spoken to any church. He never spoke it to Corinthians. He never spoke it to Colossians. He never spoke it to Roman church. Are you hearing that? He's speaking something totally different. Why? Because of what they've done. People say the pastor must treat people the same. It's impossible to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you the truth. It's few people that pastors can jump out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning. There are some people who have labored in the house of God, who have been a blessing in the house of God, that their works are following them. That will not allow the pastor to relax and God will not judge the pastor for relaxing on someone else they don't even know. They'll send the leader. Just go, I heard that uh, there's a person there. Go check him. Did you hear what I'm saying to you? 
you have to understand that Jesus only went to Lazarus. Other dead people he met on the way. Did you hear what I said to you? He went to two, in fact. To Lazarus and to Simon, the Pharisee, the 12-year daughter. But Lazarus, the way he went, he did not go as normal as he would do at other places. Why? Because of the relationship. He was accommodated there. He was fed there. He slept there. They took care of there. Martha made sure he's not hungry. Mother made sure there's, there's, there's breakfast, there's lunch, and there's supper. They made sure that he's, a, he's comfortable. So he had to go raise Lazarus. But it was also based on relationship. It was not based on the anointing only. Does it make sense to you? Now check this. They've given to him. Take took care of him. He says, nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Oh, God. Huh? You shared where? Oh, God. Pastors can be distressed. Oh, pastors may lack money for their kids at school. Oh, pastors may have uh, sometimes nothing to eat. Oh, pastors may be, you know, they go through things like all people. Why do you think that pastors are supermen? Why do you think that pastor men are, pastors are supermen of poverty? Oh, the pastor can take it. Oh, that man is <laughs> powerful. You see, now, nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Continue. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, in others, when he came for the first time to preach to them, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. He says, I was in need. No church was conscious. The Roman church did not give to me. The church in Corinth did not give to me. The Colossian church did not give to me. He says, it's only you who are sensitive to my needs. Continue. For even in Thessalonica, you know, the Thessalonian church, you sent aid Aid means something to help me. And again, for my necessities, the things that I needed. Continue. Not that I seek the gift. In other words, I'm not preaching for this. But I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. In other words, when you bless me, I don't rest until God blesses you. Continue. Indeed, I have all and abound and I'm full. Can you imagine a pastor saying that? I'm full. Having received Epaphroditus, the things sent from you. He says the way you sent, I'm full. I'm loaded. A sweet, he says, from you. A sweet smelling aroma. An acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. They are giving to Paul. Paul says it goes to God. He says, You are giving to me, I'm happy and I bless you, but God is smelling it too. It's pleasing to who? Ladies and gentlemen, when pastors have material things, when pastors don't worry about food, when they don't worry about cars, when they don't worry about houses, when they don't worry about money, it pleases God. It pleases God. When you give to the pastor, you are pleasing God. Hey, you please your pastor. Hey, I can see. Hey, hey I can see. But look at the scripture. Is the scripture clear to you? All of you? No, okay. Now, are we done? Okay. Then, I like this one. Oh, believers, they like this. Especially those who don't give, they like that one. They like it. Have you ever, when they have a need, they'll always say, uh, they pray, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his... No, 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 it's a wrong scripture for you. 
It's a wrong scripture. Why? Because it's Paul who is blessing the believers that have blessed him. This is a reaction blessing. This is a response blessing. This is a reciprocate blessing. Are you getting this? So he's reciprocate. Yes. Yeah. You see. Now he says now, after he has told them all this, he says, my God. Somebody say, my God. He did not say, your God. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you something? Do you know that we don't all have the same, we, all, we don't all have the same dimension of God? Uh, let me repeat that. Do you know that we don't, all, we don't all have the same dimension of God? Do you know that God does not relate to all of us the same? Do you know that God relates to us differently and separately according to our divine assignment? Do you know that God does not respond to the pastor as much as he can respond to the member? He does not. We are not the same. We are not called for the same thing. We are not anointed the same. So when, when Paul says, my God, he means there is a dimension of God he can speak from as an apostle that an ordinary believer cannot. I don't care. You can have somebody blessing you and say, my God will supply all of your needs. You may be missing it. You are not in full-time ministry. You are not depending on the offerings of people. You are not sent on the assignment. You are not called out to specific group of people to achieve God's agenda. So now we're going to see the God of Paul acting on the believers. He says, my God shall supply. He says, all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. They spend money on what? On their pastors. On the poor first, right? And then on their pastors. Ladies and gentlemen, We must spend money on the pastor. <clears throat> Are you hearing me? Let me tell you the reason. The reason for God to supply the needs, most of the time is when the needs of a man he sent has been met. The all supply of needs is dependent on the whole supply of the man sent by God. Is this clear? Why are you looking like this? Are, are you still here? Am I boring you? If you feel you have needs... then here is the tip. If you feel I have a, want to have a breakthrough in this, that's why sometimes, from time to time, I would give a lump sum to my father, from time to time, for my life. I mean for, for my life. For my life, for my family, for my kids. Because I know once he says, my God, then that's enough. That's what I need. Because there's a level of God, that, uh, there's a level and a dimension of God that only my father can access, that I cannot access. Instead of fasting for four days, I just take a seat and give to him and see the breakthrough. Can you see that? They don't need to fast there for their needs to be met. Did you hear that? They did not need to do the whole night prayer. They just needed to give to Paul. 
And then after that, God will supply for them. Is that clear to you? Let's move on. Somebody may say, yeah, why, should we, why shouldn't we do like, uh, like the early church, you know? Why don't we concentrate just on, the, on, the two, on these two things and that's all? Yeah, concentrate on the, on the poor, you know, which is the favorite. Then concentrate on the pastors and that's all. I'll tell you the disadvantage of that. All right? Remember, they had no church buildings. Paul has never preached in a place like this. Never. Peter has never preached in a place like this. So you get it? So, as they depended, they worshipped in the church. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, in the church, early church in the Bible, there is no church building in the Bible. Do you know that? I'm not talking about the temple of the Jews. I'm talking about the church, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They had no building. In the whole Bible, they never built even one structure. Are you getting me? So you have to get it. Because every time we think about church and read about Paul and Peter, most of the time we say at the church, we think about this. Here we are too many. Here we are too many. Let me show you something. They depended, when it comes to church, on the rich believers to work for, for worship venue. Did you hear what I said to you? They depended not just on ordinary believers, on rich believers for a place to worship. You get it? If somebody says we should, we should be like them, then how many rich people we can depend on for worship? Not worship way. In their houses. The early church was house church. Not church building church. They were worshiping. Or if you don't, uh, you don't get it. You don't get a house. They worship in homes. Right? Go to the book of Acts chapter 16. Verse 14 and 15. I, I, I want to give you the names of the people who were hosting church services in their houses. I, I, I willing, I, I, can you go with me? Lydia. Lydia was a woman who was doing clothing. And she did purple clothing. She had a purple clothing business. Clothing business. What is that? I told you that the purple clothing was your Louis Vuitton and uh, Gucci and uh, 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 Versace and, uh, 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 you know, all those uh, high brands. This, this was the woman, so, which means that this woman was a millionaire, if not a billionaire, right? Now, let's read. A certain woman, all right, a certain woman named, named who? Lydia had us. She was a seller of purple from the city of uh, Theatira who worshipped God. She was a believer, worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Continue. And when she and her household were baptized, they begged us saying, if you have judged me to be, a faithful, to, uh, to be faithful to the Lord, Come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. You get that? She said, come to my house and do what? And say. If you read other scriptures, you'll understand that they had church in the house of, Le of Lydia. Right? They had a church in the house of Lydia. That's where the church was. Now, you need to understand how the, the church used to work. When they come to you, in the place, you are the first convert and they preach the gospel and you receive the gospel, your house becomes a place of worship. You, no, you're going to get it more as I, as I explain it, right? Number two, a woman, uh, Priscilla, a couple called Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla the woman and Aquila the man, right? They had a lucrative tent making business. You get it? 
Right, Acts chapter 18, verse 1 to 3. 18, verse 1 to 3. The Bible says, And after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And there he found a Jew named Aquila, right? Born in Portus and lately uh, in Portus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, right? He came to them. Is any what? So, because he was of the same trade and he stayed with them and worked for by occupation they were tent makers. You get it? They were tent makers. They were making tents and selling tents and hiring tents. It was a lucrative business at that time. It was a great business. Can you see their business people? Can you see? Let's check if the church was in their house. Go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 9. Right? You're going to see here. Now I'm going to close now, right now. I'm about to close. 16. Uh, did I say verse? Did I say what? Verse 19 please. 19 not 9. 19. 19. Let's go to 19. So you're going to see here that now they have come to the Lord. Then, okay, the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you. Who's greeting you also? Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in there. Come on, class. Where is the church? Where is the church? Is it in the school? In in the tent is in there all churches in the early church were worshipping in the house and most houses were houses of rich people I'll tell you why at the end let's go to uh, another guy is called Philemon 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 he had servants Philemon had servants if you had servants you were rich no servant will have, you know, you hear me? You are rich. Philemon chapter 1 verse 2. It says, and to dear Aphia and uh, uh, Archippus and, and fellow soldiers and to the church in your house. Church in your house. The letter is written to, to Philemon. Then they are saying also, we also greet the church in your house. Huh? Philemon 1 verse 2, please. Right? The church in your, I want you to see that. So Paul is greeting everybody and all the leaders. And then after he has greeted the leaders, then he says he greets the church in your house. Is the Bible gone now? Is it dead? Is it dead? Philemon chapter 1 verse 2. All right. Can you see? He greets all the people. Grace be multiplied to you. Go to first. Yeah, yeah. Continue. In the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Christ. Yes. Continue. Oh my God. Is, is it called the, the Bible? Ah, Philemon 1 verse 2. Okay. So the church was taking place in the house of Philemon. The church was taking place in the house of Lydia. The church was taking place in the, in the house of Priscilla and Aquila. And all these were rich people. Who told you that poverty is spiritual? Please, please go to that verse, please. I want them to see it. That's why we have overhead projectors, so that you can see that we are not manipulating the Bible. It's, it is as we say, it is. Right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's, let me conclude now. I'm going to close by this. Okay, can you see the church is where? Is in your... Is greeting, is greeting beloved word, Afia and Akabas. Those these are leaders, the fellow soldiers, fellow soldiers with Paul. They are working together for the kingdom of God, right? Then also he says to the church, is also I'm not only greeting the leaders, but I'm also greeting the saints, the church. Where is the church? Not in the church building. Right? I hope that you are convinced that the church never had a church building, the early church in the Bible, right? Now, can we do church like them in the 21st century? 
Can we do church like them? I tried to explain to you. The answer is yes and no. Let's start with no. Can we start with no? Ladies and gentlemen, the early church had no expenses like we do. Did you hear that? The early church did not rent the building, did not rent the auditorium, did not rent the school, did not rent the tent. They were worshiping in the house. So their expenses could go only to two things. The poor believers who are in need and the pastor. So you get it? So if we try to do like them, we will have to close this building because it's thousands. We pay for this building every month. Are you hearing me? We will have to close electricity bill. We'll have to close the water bill as you go. It's five liter every time you flush in the toilet. So are you, are you hearing me? We'll have to close down the internet. We have to sell the cameras. We just need the rich people, rich people's houses. Then how many rich people today are willing to have church in their house? I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to, can I think with you today? I know I'm preaching a different sermon today, right? How, how many people? How many people? Okay, okay. As we are now, how many people that can have a house to accommodate? So it's like impossible, right? So why do they go to the houses of people with money? Because people with money, they had double story houses and the top part will be the guest part. Like a hall that will carry maybe 50 people the most. Maybe 50 people the most. So are you hearing me? So that's why they'll go to their houses. So they know there's no bill to pay. They had no sound. They had no band to pay for. They clapped hands. So if we want to do like them, let's get rid of Jabu, get rid of Ashwin. <laughs> let's get rid of them all. Are you hearing me? They had no worship team. And they had no worship practice. Their church, you get there, is simple, is in the house. Oh, hey, Finish. From the service, you go home. That's it, right? So, can the 21st century people respond to that type of a church? So the answer is what? No, we can't do like them. Here's another thing. They had simple conferences. If they had conferences or the churches, the group churches have to meet somewhere, it does not matter where they meet, whatever. They, they did not have these ones. You know, with us, we have to do what? Our conferences, we have to hire the speaker, we have to fly. There were no aeroplanes there. There's no flight ticket expenses. We fly the speaker, we hire the hotel. You see, you see the expenses. Yeah. And the other thing is that even transportation, they did not have much. They were walking on their feet, on their sandals. If it's a distance, then they'll ride on the donkey. How many donkeys we can, we can arrange today? You get me. How many donkeys we can arrange today? You see. And also their expenses will be just to ship the pastor because they use ship to go from one city to another. Ship. You see? We can't do it like them. Also, we recognize that they are poor. The reason why they are poor, also, there was concentration, concentration. They had no support from the government. Today, you have subsidy support from the government. 
you have a child, the government will give you a certain little bit of money or things like that. They did not have that, right? So we cannot do it the same. So ladies and gentlemen, each church must be relevant to its society. They did church and they were relevant to where they are at the time where they were with the generation they were serving. So we cannot do what they did exactly in our time. So we have, if you don't have a job, yes, we can help you. Yes, there are believers that can help you. If you don't have food, we can help each other and things like that. Yes, we do. But we are in the different totally context and the different totally situation and facing the different dynamics. Uh, am I saying that we should not support the poor? I'm not saying so. Let me tell you how the church can support the poor. The church can only support the poor when it increases immensely in their finances. Or number two, when the church becomes a mega church and then has more people giving and can have its needs covered, then it can do projects to the poor. That is the context we have. Are you hearing that? I hope, I hope, that, I hope that I've answered you. So ladies and gentlemen, if you are in this house, God wants you to give. Wants you to be a cheerful giver. Wants you to be excited about giving. Wants you to make giving a priority. Giving is the heartbeat of the church. Did you, did you hear what I, say, I said to you? Giving is what? Is the heartbeat of the church. In other words, when you give, you are serving. You are servicing the heart of the church. It is through giving that we reach the souls. It is through giving that we are able to do services. It is through giving that we are able to preach to the people that you cannot be able to preach to. It is through giving that even now as I'm preaching there are people who are listening to me on the internet and there are thousands of people after this who will view the message after that. You have no idea. I get inbox. Thank you for sharing the word of God. Thank you. God has given me the breakthrough. I was struck with this in my xbox i get people just thanking me i don't know them they don't know me but the internet somebody had to pay for us to be on the internet so that now we have a privilege that we can reach more people than what paul reached we can reach more people than what people peter reached we can reach more people than an early age but when we need to reach more people it needs more money are you what i'm trying to say to you so this is the reason I don't carry the mic because it's fancy I don't dress much because it's a fashion but I need to look representable to the people of different parts of the world if they're going to listen to our message because God says people are not looking on the inside no matter how much you are doing well and willing in your heart but people look on the outside appearance that's the reason we put the Happened. that's the reason we decorate that's the reason we put the flowers that's the reason we put all these things and arrange the chest and put different colors it's not because we want to be important but there's somebody that we want to reach I wish I could talk to you. Are you what I'm trying to say to you? You have no idea that people are attracted by simple things in the church. I remember somebody said, I just wanted to see the way the pastor is dressing. I went to church because I like the way he's dressing. But he likes the way he's dressing. But the pastor had the word of God. And the person went for dressing and found Jesus. Some people like the arrangement of the chairs. Some people like the carpet. Some people like different 
things it does not matter what they like but whatever they like money has been spent for that thing to be there and when money has been spent then God uses an offering as a stepping stone in order to touch the heart of a person ladies and gentlemen we are not on television for fame but there's somebody somewhere in the world that needs to hear the word of God and Paul says woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel we are called to preach the gospel Jesus says this gospel shall be preached throughout the world then the end will come but it takes money it takes giving it takes a generous giver for the gospel to go around the world somebody must give somebody must be generous somebody must honor God somebody must worship God with his substance with his money with his salary somebody say amen somebody say amen may God make you a giver may God touch your heart may God soften your heart may God make you to make him a priority may you seek the kingdom of God first and all these things that you need shall be added unto you do we have people who are saying that I'm gonna be a kingdom funder who are saying that I'm gonna be a kingdom giver who are saying that I'm gonna prioritize God above my needs above my clothes above my food above my because above my material things I'm gonna bring material things into the house of God I'm gonna bring what is needed I'm gonna make sure that my pastor is comfortable I'm gonna make sure that the church needs are met I'm gonna contribute and when you do that then my God I'm saying that when you do that my God then my God when you do that then my God then the God who called me the God who anointed me the God who gave the anointing then my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus then my God is gonna bless you then you're gonna be blessed going in and blessed going out then curses are going to be broken over your life then God is gonna remember your family then God is gonna remember your health Health, then God is gonna multiply you then God is gonna shift your business because you know the more he blesses you the more you bless the house you are an asset in the house of God you are an asset in the house of God you are important in the house of God that's why God can bless you God depends on you for his house somebody say God depends on me he depends on on you when you went for interview yeah while you were speaking and negotiating God was giving you favor because he also has his portion in the salary that you're gonna have God is not blessing you for you God is blessing you for him. God loves you because he loves himself. God created you because you are his image. So he's included. Would you include God in your finances? Will you include God in your expenditures? Will he be involved? And I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, I've been pastoring for many years from, the, from my 20s. I've seen God catapulting people. You know, into higher heights and breakthroughs and miracles and opening great doors in the church when people honored the principle of giving. It opens the atmosphere. It ushers the church into the realm of blessings where blessings are not prayed for but where blessings flow. Father, we thank you. In the name of Jesus,
that you bless us and we give you all the glory and give you all the honor. Amen. God bless you.